And so, Lord, I thank you that as the pastor, you enabled me to speak the word of God. Your word talks about a word fitly spoken, Lord. Well, I thank you for giving me the word that fits in this moment and helping me to speak it accurately as I ought. And so, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, and we give you the, the glory, the honor, and the praise. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this moment, and we truly pray that you be glorified in all that is said and done. In Jesus' name. You can agree with that. Say amen. Amen, amen. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. Verse 27 is my text or my, my scripture for today's message. Luke 22 and verse 27. I'll give you a moment to get there. I see some of you finagling your pages and so forth. Luke 22 and verse 27 it says, for who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table, yet I am among you as the one who serves? Jesus spoke these words in the upper room the night of the Passover. Here, you know, what we find if we do a, a, a good study of it and we look at the context of the scriptures of the gospel accounts, the four gospels, what we find is that Jesus had already uh, 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 instituted the Lord's Supper. He had already washed their feet. Okay? So picture that. It's the upper room. It's that last night. They've had the Lord's Supper or, or Passover. And he has washed their feet. Remember that? It says that he took the towel, he girded himself, and he actually washed their feet. And then he tells them that somebody's going to deny him. And they're all buzzing. Like, Who's going to do this? You know, who would do such a thing? And then it tells us in verse 24, right after this subject or issue of who's going to betray Jesus, it says in verse 24, according to Luke's gospel, now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. I don't know about you, but that just doesn't fit for me. We're in the upper room. We're having the Lord's Supper with Jesus. He's just washed our feet and everything. And now we're going to fuss about who's the greatest. I think it's obvious who the greatest is. Jesus, right? But they're talking about, you know, obviously Jesus is the greatest, so He's in his category. But amongst us, who's the greatest? And so they're, they're disputing. They're, they're having this discussion. Right? Verse 25. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. The greatest person in that room was Jesus, and yet he's the one who washed the feet. He's the one that served them all. You know, this issue of who is the greatest had been going on for a while. Matter of fact, we see in Luke chapter 9, what had happened was, the, the, the uh, narration of it is, is that Jesus had been on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's where he had been transformed to, you know, completely white and luminescent and so forth. And it was a phenomenal experience. Matter of fact, Peter, he says, let's build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and, and one for Elijah, you know. And, and they come, as they were coming down off of the, the mountain the next day, Jesus said, don't tell anybody about this. So they were to keep it to themselves until after his resurrection. And we could talk about why that is, but that's not the point of today's message. And so here they come down off of the mountain, and Jesus cast that devil out of that boy. And, and, and then they travel from the Mount of Transfiguration to Capernaum, to the house in Capernaum. And while they were on the way, they start arguing or disputing. Matter of fact, let's read the account from Luke's first, and then we'll go over to um, Mark chapter 9 and read the same account. In verse 46, it says, Then a dispute of, uh, arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. Now, this is 
between the Mount of Transfiguration and journey into Capernaum. This is before they're in the upper room on Passover night. They got this thing going on amongst them. Who's going to be the great? I'm the greatest. No, you're the and no, you know, oh, Can you believe that? We're talking about the Lord's disciples. We're talking about the apostles. And they're going back and forth about who's the greatest. Makes me think of Muhammad Ali. Remember him back years ago? I am the greatest, right? Can you imagine the disciples doing stuff? Now, I know they didn't do that exact same thing, you know what I mean? But can you imagine them? They're jockeying for who's going to be the greatest. So it says there in verse 47, And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and said to him, um, by him, and said to them, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all will be great. Now if we go to Mark's account in Mark chapter 9, verse 33, it says, And when he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what is it you, were, you disputed amongst yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. Verse 35, And he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him, talking about the little child, in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Interesting thing, we, we see the same account in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. But only there, Jesus said, uh, he took the little child and he set him in the midst. And verse 3, it says, Matthew 18, verse 3, it says, And assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. So we see here in the scriptures that the disciples had been uh, squabbling with one another about who was going to be the greatest. Now you have to understand, these guys were not much different than everybody else at the time. You got to remember that they had been born and raised in a nation where greatness was being measured by their family structure, being measured by their community, being measured by their religious establishment as a nation, being measured by the Roman occupation and the structure that it had. Greatness was always something that was to be obtained or aspired to, and it was always measured by these references that they had always known. It wasn't like they were on an eagle trip and they wanted to be a tyrant or something. They were just, I'm going to be the best. How I many you know it's okay to be the best? The problem is, is when being the best floats over into arrogance and it tries to become the greatest. God wants us to be our best. Matter of fact, God created us to be our best. God always helps us to become our best. Amen. We never start out at our best. We always progress to our best. And it's a good thing. I mean, you know, it's good to be better today than it was yesterday. I'm so glad that I'm not the same that I was September the 9th, 1979, when I gave my life to Christ. I mean, you know, it's good to get better. Amen. But these guys, their idea of greatness was in a measurement that they had been indoctrinated with, that they had been raised in and so forth. And so they looked around <coughs> excuse me, and greatness was being measured by position, by title, by power, by wealth, by fame, and all those things. I mean, think about it. In their day, they had what was called the chief priest. Remember reading that in your Bible? chief priest. Well, you know what? If there were chief priests, that means there were priests that weren't chief. That means those chief priests were over other priests. And they were thought themselves to be the elite of the priests. 
And isn't it interesting that when you watch the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels, you always find it was the chief priest that he was always having trouble with. Well, if they were such chief priests, then they should have had a better sense to know who they were talking to. See, the problem is, is that when the greatness is not measured by what kingdom greatness is, it always leads to human arrogance, and arrogance always blinds us. Blinds us and deceives us. Because arrogance always measures inaccurately. Interesting thing is that here we are, you know, so they're on the road going to Capernaum, and they're wrangling, they're jockeying back and forth about who's going to be the greatest amongst them. Jesus calls them out on it when they get to the house there in Capernaum. And he's trying to help them. Look, boys, you have to understand something. I know you've been trained to think that greatness is based upon what you have, but it's not. I know you've been trained to think that greatness is based upon the title that you have, but it's not. He's trying to explain to them that true greatness is a whole lot different than this world's way of considering greatness. And check it out. Somewhere between this trip from the Mount of uh, Transfiguration to Capernaum, and they're arguing on the road there, and the Last Supper, guess what? In Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, Zebedee's wife or the mother of John and, and, and James comes to Jesus. Check this out. Matthew 20 and verse 20, it says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him uh, with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? How I many you know Jesus, Jesus is not the genie in the bottle? What do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and one on the left, in your kingdom. And now, you have to understand, the right hand was the most prestigious and greatest place of honor. That's why it always tells us that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. It is the place of the greatest honor that can be given. And she's go, here she is at Jesus. She's saying, okay, when you come into your kingdom, I want one of my boys. You pick whichever one you want, but I want one of my boys on the right and I want the other one on the left. I mean, you know, it's a sad day when your mother has to do your bidding for you. Right? Talking about greatness in this world system. See, even mama had bought into this ideology of greatness. So much so that she would actually go before Jesus and ask for the placement of her two boys at both sides. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am able to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said, the boys, they said, We are able. Of course they did. So he said to them, I mean, after all, they think they should be on the right and the left. Why don't they think they can drink of the cup? Right? He, and he said, so he said to them, verse 23, you will drink uh, the drink of, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit on my right and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is prepared by my father. And when the 10 heard it, they all just clapped in the plot. No, they didn't. Look what it says. When the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Boy, you want to talk about how to alienate yourself and lose friends. That's a good way to do it right there. Isn't it interesting that when we buy into this world system, when we buy into the lies of this world and trying to achieve and accomplish and become great in this world, in the eyes of others, it always means that we lose relationships in the process. It always damages our relationships. You cannot become great in this world without the mentality of having to walk on somebody else to get there. But in the kingdom... In God's kingdom, we don't walk on someone. We don't step over someone. We help someone. They were, they were upset. But Jesus, how I many you know Jesus had to do damage control? But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. 
and those who are great exercise authority over them. Sounds like what he said in chapter 9 of Luke and, and Mark, doesn't it? Yet it shall not be so among you. He said that too. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoa. Don't you know that just really took the, the air out of the balloon? Because you got to remember their idea of greatness was that everybody's serving them, not them serving everybody. They had seen the Pharisees and the other religious leaders of their day. They watched them walk around in their long robes and looking all pious and everything. And everybody catering to them. Everybody telling them how good they are. That was their standard. That was their measurement. And now Jesus is saying, be the servant. Be the servant. Yet it shall not be so among you. I'm sorry to tell you it is. I'm sorry to tell you that there are some churches it is. I'm sorry to tell you that there are some places in the body of Christ it is. Just like the world. Where you have your rank and file. You have all, everybody's got to be in their place. It's all, you know, kind of thing. And it, folks, it was never meant to be that way. <clears throat> God's not against order. He's not against structure. He is the creator of order and structure. But God never meant for order and structure to become tools for a person to dominate another person. Or to subjugate that person to themselves in order to make themselves feel superior to another. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Boy, don't you know that went over like a lead balloon? Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus gave us the example. He lived it. He didn't just simply try to pattern something and say, okay, boys, here's the way I'd like you to do it when I'm gone. No, he, it was genuine. It came from his heart. Remember Jesus said, except you humble yourself like a child. See, you have to understand something. This servant leadership thing that it's been called or whatever you want to term it as is fine with me. But what we find is that if you're going to be great in God's kingdom, you've got to be a servant. And this servant thing is not just a function, and it's not an attitude. It's a condition of the heart. And it's that condition of the heart that then affects our attitude, that then affects the way we behave. It's something on the inside working out on the outside. Where greatness of this world is always on the outside, supposedly doing something on the inside. But it never really does. Even after the resurrection, can you believe the rivalry was still going on? Look at John chapter 21 and verse 18. Jesus had just restored Peter, as some people say, uh, say that is, where Jesus said to Peter, said, Peter, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know that I love you. Because see, Jesus had said to Peter, he says, Simon Peter, do you love me with a agape love? Do you love me with a God kind of love, that unconditional, unending love? And Peter's response was, Lord, you know that I love you with phileo or brotherly love. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And then again, he says to him, he says, Simon Peter, do you love me with the God kind of love, with agape love? And Peter again responds and says, Lord, you know that I phileo love you. I love you like a brother. And then the third time, Jesus says to him, he says, Simon Peter, do you love me like a brother? And Peter, he says he was disappointed. And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you like a brother. See, the cool thing about that was Peter was not willing to let the pressure of the situation move him to say something that he wasn't willing to stand behind. He held to his word. That's why people believe that was a moment of restoration. But interestingly enough, after that, Jesus says to Peter, he says, most assuredly I say to you in verse 18, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wish, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not want. Verse 19, this he spoke signifying what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. 
Now, he meant that literally. Jesus is actually walking away, and he's saying, follow me for Peter to follow him. And so Peter's walking behind the Lord, and it says in verse 20, Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, following, who also had leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, who is it that betrays you? Peter, verse 21, Peter, seeing him, that's John, remember the rivalry, remember the greatest thing, right? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? It doesn't matter. If you and I are going to fulfill our destinies, we cannot be moved by, what about that man? What about that person? What about them? What about this? We're going to have to get our eyes on Jesus and keep him there. And we're going to have to follow him like he said. We live in a society that's no different than that of Jesus' time. We have people striving to be great. Maybe even amongst ourselves. But I got news for you. True greatness is not what this world tells us. This world tells us that greatness is measured by what you have. You got, you know, I drive a Buick, you drive a, a, a Cadillac. So you're greater. Not really, but whatever, right? Doesn't matter what you drive because it's not measured. Jesus actually said this, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he has. If you think what you have makes you who you are, you've bought into the lie of this world system. Because no matter what you have, it can never make you who you really are. See, why do we have those things? God blesses the, us with things. God wants us to be blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. And when we get so concerned about being blessed ourselves, it actually hinders and limits the blessings of God in our lives that limits us from being the blessing we, was, we were meant to be. I heard a fellow say one time, it's, if God can get it through you, he will get it to you. And that's the problem many times, is he can't get it through us, and so it limits him getting it to us. The other thing is that our society measures greatness by fame. Fame. I mean, think about that. Seems like we can't turn the TV on or pick up a newspaper or whatever where they're not talking about the fame of someone. Did you know that fame is not for personal popularity, but fame was always meant to be given to God as glory? It's not about glorifying man. It's about glorifying God. But see, men and women take that to themselves in order to try to make themselves feel better about themselves and to try to give themselves an edge when it comes to other people. We saw there in the scriptures that I've read to you today about how that Jesus made it clear that in the world system, there are people who have power they have authority. They have influence. And that's considered greatness. The greater the power, the greater the authority, the greater the influence, the greater you are. But that's not true. That might be the way this system works here on this world, but that's not true greatness. So if you and I aspire to be great according to this world system, then when we walk over into heaven and we say, Hello, Jesus, I'm glad to be home. Guess what? Our so-called greatness here will not matter one bit there. It would be better for us to have the true greatness of God here in this lifetime and take, us, take it with us there when we get there. Why do I share this with you today? Because we continue to live in a society and it seems like it's getting more so as time goes on. Where we think that the government is here for us. Where we think that people are supposed to be doing things for us. Where it's all about us. That's not a certain... See, this world system of greatness is self-centered. It's all about me, 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 me. But God's greatness is about others. It's about serving. Jesus said, 
Didn't he say that? He says, I, I'm one who serves among you, and I lay down my life. You can't get any greater than Jesus. True greatness 